we're going to talk about magic squares of squares. So first thing we're going to do is uh, talk about what a magic square is. We're going to start with a 3 by 3 grid. We're going to have 8, and a 1, and a 6, and a 3, and a 5, and a 7, and a 4, and a 9, and a 2. So this is a 3 by 3 array of numbers. And what's incredible here is that if you add the numbers down the columns, so like 8 plus 3 plus 4, you're going to get 15. You're going to get 15 no matter what column you add down. Or if you look at the rows, and if you add those up, then you also get 15. So all the rows add up to 15. And also the two diagonals, so the principal diagonal. So this is 5 plus 2 is 7, plus 8 is 15. And then if you look at the other diagonal, so 4 plus 6 is 10, plus 5 is 15. So everything adds up to 15. So columns, rows, and the two diagonals add up to 15. That's a perfect pure magic square. In fact, this is the earliest, or you know, up, up to some sort of re rearrangement of the of the numbers. It's uh, it's the earliest known uh, recorded magic square. It's usually called the the low shoe. There's records of it from about 2200 BC. The Chinese tradition has it that the emperor Yu uh, saw this magic square on the back of a turtle. It's a sort of beautiful story. I know there are lots of other magic squares. We're going to talk about them shortly. Yeah. Is a magic square still a magic square if any number is repeated, or is that kind of imperfect? I so I would argue that those are imperfect magic squares, and and in fact that's that's kind of what makes it hard, I think, to to find magic squares. If you allow repetitions, you know, you you can really find magic squares quite easily, right? I could just repeat all the numbers here, right? Just take. Your favorite number, mine is 19. I think it would be 9, but 9 is not prime, so it's 19. So if I put 19 everywhere in these nine entries, I'll just get a magic square that way. But it feels like it's not, it's not a real magic square. It feels like a fake magic square. So what I want to do is look at 3 by 3 magic squares, but I want to impose one more condition, uh, which is that I want the entries themselves to be the squares of numbers. So I'm going to draw for you an example of this, and it'll be a bit of a cheat. People who've been seeing number file videos for a while are going to recognize this. So this is 29 squared, 1 squared, 47 squared, 41 squared, 37 squared, 1 squared, 23 squared, 41 squared, and 29. And this is a very famous uh, magic square, and it, it was made famous by number file. So this is the, the Parker square. So I'm not calling it the Parker Square. Matt, you know what this video is I'm called. I'm calling it for crying out loud. This was famously Matt's attempt at, at all squares. That's uh, right. That's right. It's a very good attempt. I think this, this is a very reasonable uh, attempt. In fact, it, it complies with almost all the requirements of, of, a, of a magic square of squares, right? So every single entry is a square number, right? Uh, and it's, it's true that if you add up all the rows and all the columns, and if you add up the two diagonals, it all adds up to the same number. So it, it satisfies the main requirements for being a magic square. Doesn't, doesn't uh, one of the diagonals fail? Wait, sorry, can we check that? This diagonal here works. This diagonal here doesn't work. One of the diagonals does not. And so in, in that sense, it's not quite a magic square of squares. It's what people tend to call a, a, a semi-magic square. Um, and there's some repetitions of the entries. So for example, you see the two ones here, you see a couple of 29s, a couple of 41s. And so it sort of feels like it's, it's cheating just a little bit. But it's a really good attempt. Okay, So, so you know, it's, it's a good starting point. You know, when you, sometimes in math, when you can't solve a really difficult problem, you try to solve a simpler problem. You know, and, and making some of these, allowing some of these entries to be uh, the same as a way of, of trying to simplify the problem that, and, and in a way that might use some interesting mathematics as well. Okay, Parker Square. Great. Good attempt. Yes. <laughs> okay. So there are there are a couple of other uh, squares that I want to show you because so so as we saw in the Parker Square, there's just a couple of things that aren't quite right, um, and there are some really famous ones. These are sort of from the late '90s. So one of them is called the Bremner Square. Okay, this is a big one. Okay, so this is another attempt at a magic square of squares. And it's, it's very good in sort of a different way from the Parker square. This time you'll notice almost immediately that there's two entries that are not squares. That's where this fails. That but, feels like an even more fundamental failure to me. Yes. Are they close yes. to being squares? Uh, I, not really, I don't think. It is a little bit sad that they're not, they're not really squares. But you know, what, what, does, what is true here, though, is that the columns and the rows and both diagonals add up to the same thing. So somehow we managed to at least preserve that property, but then we broke the squares. We do have distinct entries. So 
you know, you're sort of, you feel like you're making progress. I mean, it'd be, you know, cool to have one that had like eight squares, you know, and maybe only one that's not a square. Um, I don't know of one, and, and I'm, I'm not sure if one has been found yet. There's another square consisting of square entries, which is almost a magic square. It's a semi-magic square. It's by Salos. And in a sense, it's sort of a, an improvement on the Parker square in that all the entries are distinct. However, just like with a Parker square, one of the diagonals doesn't add up to the same number that all the others uh, add up to. That feels like one of the best attempts so far, doesn't it? Like... That's right, yes. In fact, it's, it's really nice that if you just remove one of the conditions, then you really can find them. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very difficult problem precisely because of how all of the conditions come together. Of course, this is a fundamental question here. Does one exist? Has anyone ever found a magic square of squares? As far as I know, no. It's, it's really sad. And in fact, what I want to do today is try to convince you that there probably isn't one. Okay. So I know that's sort of a, a, a sad thing to say. Uh, I would love it for it to be a magic square of squares. Um, but, but I think sort of, of geometry is giving us a bunch of indications that this just might not be the case. And so in fact, what, what geometry suggests is that if there is a magic square of squares, it's going to be really, really difficult to find. And it's sort of be, beyond what, what we can do by just sort of like trying small things. This doesn't look like geometry to me. Right, right. Oh my god, yes. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Let me try to show you where, where the geometry at least starts coming up. Let's do it. So we're trying to find nine numbers, each of them a square. And so I, I need to give them names. I'll call them x1 squared and x2 squared and x3 squared, and so on. What we're hoping for is nine distinct positive integers, uh, x1 through x9, um, that I can put into uh, one of these 3 by 3 grids in such a way that the, the rows, the columns, and the two diagonals add up to the same number. And so I can actually write out what those conditions are in terms of just algebra. I, like I a just, like a big monster equation. Or? Like yeah, it's it's going to be a, a set of monster equations. In fact, so let me show you. So for example, I need to know that the first row is equal to the sum of the elements of the first row is equal to the sum of the elements in the second row. So I can just write out this monster equation. Okay. I also need the same two sums to equal the sum of the third row. So I can write another equal sign here. This all has to be the same. Okay. I also need to know that this sum is the same as the sum of the two diagonals. So let me do those next. Yep. So there's x1 squared plus x5 squared plus x9 squared. And then the other diagonal, so it'll be x3 squared plus x5 squared plus x7 squared. This is a bit messy, but we still have to do the columns. So the first column will be x1 squared plus x4 squared plus x7 squared. Okay, and then I'll do the second column, x2 squared plus x5 squared plus x8 squared. Okay, and I'm still missing the third column. Okay, but here's something, this is a really important observation. So once I know that all three rows add up to the same number, and the first two columns add up to the same number, that forces the last column to add up to the same number as, as all the previous uh, rows and columns. And so this last thing is not a, a condition that we need to sort of set out because it's already implied by all the other ones that we have imposed. So this is sort of a, an important thing because it cuts down on the number of equal signs that I've written. Okay, so there's only one, two, three, four, five, six equal signs. I don't need one more equal sign to say that this is all equal to the sum of the last column. That's an important geometric point. Okay, so we have a mess here. So we have this like huge system of equations. Okay. And so I need to make sort of a, a few observations about the system of equations. What I want to try to argue soon is that it's going to be really difficult to try to solve this particular system of equations with the extra requirements that all these x's are different. Okay. And this is really sort of the important, the important bit. I feel like you don't have to make that argument to me. Okay. I, it, it already <laughs> looks difficult, but all right. Do you okay. want more paper? Sounds good, yes. We have nine variables and we have uh, these six equations. And so I want, to, I want to think of these nine variables as like a point in some kind of space. And this space has to have room for this many coordinates. Okay, so I want this to be a point. It's, it looks like this is going to be a point in some kind of nine-dimensional space, you know? Like usually we have like a three-dimensional space that has like x, y, and z coordinates. There's only three coordinates. Here I'm going to need a space where I can write down nine coordinates. Okay, so that looks like it could be a nine-dimensional space. But there's something really special about the equations that we have that allow me to cut things down sort of by one dimension. Instead of sort of, even though I'm going to write the, my points using nine coordinates, 
there are really sort of only eight dimensions that are in the works. In the same way that, that we talked about, uh, you know, some squares feel like, you know, they might be a little fake, there is a sense in which some squares, even though they appear different, they feel like in our bones they're kind of the same. Okay, and let, let me kind of show you that with something that's probably a little more familiar, which is sort of the uh, Pythagorean triangles. This is a very famous triangle, the 3-4-5 triangle, and we have that 3 squared plus 4 squared is equal to 5 squared. Right? This is that Pythagorean relation. But, you know, here's a, it's a different triangle, but this is going to be a 6-8-10 triangle. And there's something funny about this, which is that, okay, it's still true, so 6 squared plus 8 squared uh, is equal to 10 squared. But somehow these triangles don't really feel that different. It just feels like I took this triangle and I just kind of scaled it up. In a sense, the, you know, the triangles literally are different, but they don't feel like a genuinely different triangle. It looks like I just took the triangle I already knew and I scaled it up. And the same thing is going to happen with things like magic squares. It doesn't even have to be magic squares or squares, right? There's the low shoe, and so I can just take the low shoe and just multiply everything by two. So I'm going to put a, a 16 here, and a 2 there, and a 12 there, and a 6, and a 10, and a 14, and an 8, and an uh, 18, and a 4, okay? And now, everything adds up to 30 this time. But that's not very surprising. I, I just scaled every single number by 2, and so, you know, the equations that give you a, a magic square, you know, it's just like multiplying those equations by 2. And so this doesn't really feel like a genuinely different magic square from the low shoe. In, in a literal sense, it is different, but somehow it sort of came from the same mold. And so, so that's really the important thing, is that, that when we look at all of these coordinates and I multiply them by 7, when I look at my magic square of squares, each one of these entries will get multiplied by 49, because 7 squared is 49. And so every single entry will get multiplied by 49, and then it'll still be true that the rows and the columns and the two diagonals will add up to the same. Any solution to this problem, and I scale it up or down, I could also just have fractions instead in there, um, I'll still have a magic square of squares. So these solutions have this very nice scaling property. And what that means is that even though you see sort of nine coordinates, you only really have about eight degrees of freedom. So the reason that's important is that, so the, the natural habitat uh, for these equations is something like an eight-dimensional space. What do I mean by the habitat of an equation? So let me just remind you, you know, if I, if I just worked in the usual plane, where I had x and y coordinates, so I had two coordinates, I have two dimensions, you know, I can look at an equation like this, x squared plus y squared equals 1. This is one equation in this two-dimensional space, and it cuts out for us a circle of radius 1, x squared plus y squared equals 1. And so what we're doing here is something similar. It's just much harder to visualize, because I'm going to work in a space that technically has nine coordinates, but only really eight degrees of freedom. And inside that space, I'm going to look at the solutions of some big set of polynomials. And this set of polynomials will carve out a geometric shape, just like x squared plus y squared equals 1 carves out a geometric shape on the plane. It's just that it's, you know, it's hard to visualize eight-dimensional space. So I, I don't know how to draw that here. Um, but, but the object is out there, and it, it exists. So not only is that impossible to imagine the playing field, you also don't even know what the configuration of the players are. Right, that's right. Yes, yes. So, so we really have to sort of use, use our imagination and the algebra. This is sort of a really important idea that, that we're, we're sort of trying to do some geometry, but, but when we can't visualize things, sometimes the algebra is still there and we can work with the algebra instead of the geometry. So we have this eight-dimensional space. Um, and if you look back at the set of, of equations that we wrote, there are six equal signs. And so each one of these equal signs is putting a constraint on this eight-dimensional space. So you start with this eight-dimensional space, and then I put a constraint in it. And so now what I'm holding is probably a seven-dimensional thing. And then I put another constraint in it. And so now these two constraints have to be satisfied simultaneously. And so the intersection is probably something that's six-dimensional. And I keep doing this. And if I have six constraints, well, OK, I'm just you know, going to write eight minus six is equal to 2. Once I sort of put all these constraints together, it looks like what I should have is some kind of surface, some kind of two-dimensional thing. Each constraint is sort of cutting me down in one dimension. I started with 8 degrees of freedom, and I've taken away 6. And so um, even though it's very hard to actually visualize something like this, it looks like it, it could be some kind of surface. So there's some two-dimensional surface that would hold the key to everything. Exactly. This is exactly the point. There is out there, there is this sort of incredible, you know, now I'll just do like a metaphor for it. There's this two-dimensional surface, and each point 
on that surface is going to have coordinates x1, x2, all the way to x9. And this point encodes one of these magic squares of squares. Now what's important... Has this surface got a name? Uh, I... no. Can I suggest one? What, what would you like to call it? Really? The Parker surface. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, let's call it the Parker surface. Yeah, so, so any point on the Parker surface is going to give you a magic square of squares. Now, this surface really is there. I, I think one of the, the things we have to realize is that, that these x's could also be like not just integers, right? We are looking for integers. We want integers. But, but you know, if I just sort of write out these uh, equations and I let x1 through x9, you know, be more general numbers, I mean like pi or e or, you know, some, something with an infinite decimal expansion that's random, um, those are perfectly good numbers too. And so what happens is that the square is there, but almost every time you write one of these points down on it, there's at least one coordinate that's just not going to be an integer or a fraction. And so, so what we're really trying to do is, you know, our job is to try to find uh, points on the surface, all of whose coordinates are integers uh, and distinct. Okay. And this is, this is where things get tricky because inside this space, Right? You can actually take something that looks kind of like a plane, and then it'll sort of cut the surface. And this will be, for example, the locus where like, maybe two of the coordinates are the same. That could definitely happen. And you know, things like the Parker square you know, have the property that some of, of the entries are the same. And so, for example, it can be a point that happens to lie there. And this is the tragedy that, that we seem to face, is that on the surface, every time we have a point that seems to give us a magic square of squares, these points tend to lie on these very special curves of the surface uh, where you have conditions like you know, x1 is equal to x2 or x3 is equal to minus x7 or you know, something like this. Because when you first told me about the surface, I thought maybe there'd be no points on the surface where all, all of them are integers, but there are some there, so. That's exactly right. And, and this, you, you hit on something really important, Brady, which is that this is what makes this problem really difficult, is that, that the surface really has points with integer coordinates. It's just that we don't like the points that we see. There's also the one where you've set everything equal. Just put everything equal to one. That's a perfectly good point on the surface. Three is equal to 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 three. That'll work. This surface is obviously of infinite size. Oh yeah. 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 There's there's lots and lots of points on on the surface. So when this is what makes it hard. So so in in there's this area of math called Diophantine geometry that that tries to exactly solve this kind of problem where you take a collection of polynomial equations, like the ones that define the uh, magic square of squares, and, and they try to find integer solutions uh, or prove that there are no integer solutions other than sort of, you know, a few obvious ones that we see, but that we're not really interested in. The same thing happens with Fermat's last theorem, which is really aggravating. You know, Fermat's last theorem has solutions, right? You know, 0 to the n plus 1 to the n equals 1 to the n. So the Fermat equation has solutions. What makes it really difficult is to show that there are no solutions other than you know, the solutions that contain at least one zero. Okay? And that's, uh, that, that's a much more difficult problem. In math, we have all these, you know, a whole slew of techniques for showing that systems of equations have no integer solutions whatsoever. But that's not the case here. There are integer solutions. So what we're trying to do is to show that there aren't solutions other than the ones that we actually see and that's a much more difficult problem to solve. You told me earlier yeah. that you've come to the conclusion that it's really unlikely that one of these exists. What you have shown me so far yeah. has made me more hopeful that one exists. Yes, I understand. What you're, so so why, why do I think that one might not exist? OK, yeah, I, I guess I did. Yeah, I need more a paper. sheet of paper. More yeah, paper. To, Take so. away my hope. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to try to explain why I think that even though we have this huge surface worth of points, all of which actually give you a magic square of squares, there's just no point where all of the entries are integers and they're distinct. Why do these points even exist in the first place? And, and so this is a philosophical point, but it's you know, po points that satisfy polynomial equations that, that are you know, all integers are very, very rare. They're sort of almost accidents of nature. And, and this is sort of something really important to bear in mind. So we know if instead of a surface, if we had a curve, 
curves come in sort of three flavors from the, this sort of integer arithmetic point of view. The first one is called rational, and in fact, the circle that we were looking at before, this is kind of a perfect example of a rational curve. What makes these curves themselves have lots and lots of points that have either rational or integer coordinates. You know, here's, here's already a point in, on the surface, 0, 1. If I sort of take the line that connects that point to some number t on the real number line, then I can do a little bit of analytic geometry and compute this thing. You'll see that it's 2t squared divided by t squared plus 1, and then t squared minus 1 over t squared plus 1. This actually has to do with Pythagorean triples, but that's a story for a different day. What's important here, you see, is that if t is like an integer or some rational number, then these expressions are also going to be integers of fractions more generally. There's heaps of rational numbers on the real line. And so I just pick some rational number t, and I do this construction, and it gives me a point on my curve that has a rational coordinate. So rational curves have this like incredible property that the moment you have one point, okay, I need, I need one point to get started, then I can use that one point to construct lots and lots and lots of other points. Then there's elliptic curves. So elliptic curves sort of have this funny kind of shape, usually. They're defined by cubic polynomials. Elliptic curves have this incredible thing that you can add points on them. Okay, so if I take p and q, okay, this is not p plus q, but if I just sort of reflect it down, I, I can call this p plus q. And this sort of crazy little construction that I just did happens to actually sort of satisfy things like associativity, which is something that, you know, if I have three things, you know, I can move the parentheses around. So elliptic curves have this crazy property that you can add points on them. And the reason that's important is because it allows you to also create new points out of old points. So if I have an old point, I can add it to itself, for example, and then create a new point. And then I can add that point to itself and create a new point. And so, so elliptic curves have this, also this property that, that if I start with a point, I can propagate it. So rational curves are great. Elliptic curves are great in that you know, you, they can come with lots of points. And then there's general type curves. And those, those are sort of, well, they're, they're sort of more complicated. But one thing that's amazing is that they always have finitely many points with coordinates that are rational. This, this is a spectacular theorem from the early 80s, maybe 1982. It was proved by uh, Faltings, and he, he got the field medal for this theorem. So this, this was sort of a, a, big, a big deal. It was called the Mordell conjecture back then, and now it's Faltings' theorem. What we have is not a curve, okay? It is, it is a surface, but I'm telling you this story because it actually plays a very key role in, in our surface. So, so when we have curves, these sort of come in three different flavors. Two of those flavors have lots and lots of points, and one flavor does not. So what happens with, with the surface that we were calling the, the, the Parker surface, right, is that as a consequence of some work that me and a couple of co-authors, Nels Brown and Jordan Thomas, were working on, is we managed to show that on this surface right here, there are only finitely many curves of these two types. And this is, this is really something that surprised us. So a surface is full of curves, it's made, made of curves. Exactly, exactly. You can, you can take a surface and just like chop it up into lots of curves. And then, you know, if you're looking for points on that give you a magic square of squares, one thing you might try to do is, instead of looking at the whole surface, just look at a curve inside that surface. And maybe you get lucky, and maybe your curve is one of these two types, and then you can use what we know about these two types to actually construct magic squares of squares. But the sad thing is that the surface that parametrizes magic squares of squares, the Parker surface, has only finitely many of these rational or elliptic curves. But doesn't it only need one? It only needs one. You're right. But, but here's the, the, the crazy thing. It's, it, it has more than one. In fact, this, uh, this Parker surface has 368 of these curves that, that we know of. So there's at least 368 of these rational or elliptic curves. The sad thing, though, is that the way we've constructed these is that we, we looked at slices like this. You know, what happens if I take x1 equal to x2, that gives me some kind of curve on the surface. And then either this curve or, you know, it, the curve itself might break into a few pieces when I do the slicing. You know, those individual curves are either rational or elliptic, but they have this property that x1 is equal to x2. So, so the 368 curves that we can find, they contain points, but all of the points on these curves are, we're, are going to give us these kind of fake magic squares, which is really, really sad. Um, okay, and so here's the final kicker, though. There is a, a conjecture. Um, so, so Parker's surface, so this has finitely many, finitely many rational and elliptic curves. So, so our idea to try to use these curves 
to produce points, uh, it isn't looking so good. Like I say, this is you know some theorem that came out of of, of work that that uh, me and a couple of, of co-authors were uh, working on, and I mean it was kind of neat. I mean, we didn't expect that that we would be able to prove something about this very specific surface. But now the the kicker is that there's there's something called the the Langvoida conjecture. This is the the incredible thing. This surface that we have here is a particular kind of surface. It's also called a general type surface, and Lang and Voida sort of made a, a series of very deep conjectures. But when you apply those conjectures to the surface, what it says is that outside of the rational and the elliptic curves, there can be at most finitely many points on this, on this surface, who, all of whose coordinates are integers. Right? There's tons and tons of points on the surface, but there's only going to be finitely many points uh, out, uh, outside of, of the, this nice locus of rational elliptic curves all of whose uh, coordinates are going to be integers. There's finitely many, I'll call them rational points, outside the rational and elliptic curves. So where does that leave us? I get the feeling from talking to you, as soon as yeah. a search space becomes finite, you become very despondent and lose hope. Yes. It's finite because of this sort of general conjecture, but often finite can mean empty as well. And so, so it's entirely possible that it's not, not just finite, it just isn't there. There just isn't uh, a set of of points. So somehow the moral of the story is that either we need to find some more of these rational or uh, elliptic curves on the surface and hope for the best. There's only a finite supply of them, so we're not, you know, we can't just keep trying this all the time. And and in fact, you know, we might actually get a complete list at some point of all of these. And then, you know, we really understand rational, you know, points on rational and elliptic curves. So once we have that finite list, final list, we'll be able to ascertain whether you know you get one of these magic squares of squares at least sort of from that point of view or the other hope is that well you know we, we do this and we find nothing but somehow there's this miracle and and for some reason that we just don't understand there's a couple you know one or a few more sporadic points on the surface all of whose coordinates are integers but but everything we know about the geometry of surfaces and the geometry of curves is really pointing to the idea that there just isn't a three by three magic square of squares in the way that we would like it with distinct integer uh, coordinates, which is kind of sad. But I want to end on a good note though. So, okay, I need one more piece of paper. Okay. So what I want to show you is something that's kind of mind boggling. So we've been asking for magic squares of squares, which were three by three grids that had this property that the the columns, the rows, and the two diagonals added up to the same thing, and all the entries were squares. Okay, but now you can do, we can go for broke here. You got a four by four now. You got a four by four now, and this is kind of amazing. Okay, so this is a four by four magic square of squares. This is not a fake magic square of squares. This is, this is the real deal. Due to Euler, around 1770, thereabouts. These magic squares of squares have a very long history. If you look here, sort of all the rows, all the columns, and the two diagonals add up to the same number, 85, 15. So this is kind of crazy. You know, there's a 4 by 4, but there isn't a 3 by 3. Okay. And if you go on the internet, you'll also find a 5 by 5, and a genuine one, not a fake one, you know, like we, and if you dig far, you know, there's also a 6 by 6, and so on. From the geometry point of view, this is actually not too surprising. In fact, I would actually think it would be really cool to show that, that if you take an n by n grid, then and n is at least 4, then you can produce one of these magic squares of squares. And so... What happened when you kicked up? Because I thought if you applied... When you, I thought if you applied that same process you just showed me right. to this, you'd have the same problem. You'd come up with a surface that was really constrained. Exactly. Okay, so what happened, right? So, yeah. so let me just sort of explain briefly, that, right? So if I have like an n by n grid, right, that means that I'm going to have something like what we did before. So this is n entries this way and n entries that way, okay? So if you have an n by n grid, you have n rows, you have n columns, and you still only have two diagonals, okay? But now, okay, how many variables do you have? Well, there's n times n, so there's n squared variables. So in the 3x3 three three case, there were nine variables. In the 4x4 four four case, there were sort of 16 entries. So if, if you work on an n by n grid, there's going to be n squared variables. OK, so what, what has happened here is that the, the space in which we're working in, right, the number of coordinates that we're going to need, is growing really fast. 
But, but the number of conditions that we're trying to impose on that space is not growing anywhere near as fast as, as the space itself. So the space itself has dimension n squared minus 1. And then I have 2n plus 2 things that I need to set equal to each other. So the Parker surface is no longer exactly. two-dimensional. Exactly. It's no longer two-dimensional. It's like a huge blob. Exactly. It's like a huge blob, right? right. We go up one dimension to n equals uh, 4, right? And now we're in 15 dimensions. We've made roughly a tut. And so it's like a big blob. It's not a surface anymore. Parker and, blob. Yes, that's right. The Parker blob in n dimensions. And so the, the cool thing, though, is that, that these sort of conjectures that we have about points on these blobs, right? It's not a surface anymore. It's a much bigger blob. And so things get harder and harder as these dimensions go up. But, but the, the, the main point is that the, the geometry of these spaces, as, the, as n grows, it actually becomes more positively curved which means that it can harbor tons and tons of these kinds of rational and elliptic curves. And so, so in fact, um, for, for blobs of this kind, as n grows, we actually suspect there are lots and lots of points on those blobs. And so it's sort of not too surprising from the point of view of geometry that you would find a 4 by 4 magic square of squares, or a 5 by 5, or a 6 by 6. You know? In fact, it would be really cool to prove that you can get an n by n for n at least 4. Now, do you know what would be cooler? finding some number out there, n by n square, where there isn't a solution again. Oh my god, that would be amazing. Like some, by be... some freak curve. Yes, that's right. And that could happen because, you know, in fact, these spaces are very singular. And so sort of the, the notions that we have about what ought to happen may or may not work in those spaces. I mean, we sort of think that probably it's going to be okay, but we don't really know. And, and no one has really sort of sat down to explore these, these spaces. There's, there's some really interesting mathematics. You know, at, at first, it you know, might seem like, oh, we're just having some fun with, with squares. But there's some really deep geometry that's, that's going on uh, behind the scenes. And in fact, I, I can't resist saying this, but, but this square that Euler uh, came up with is, is really important in the proof that every integer is a sum of, every natural number is a sum of four squares. There's a very famous theorem of Lagrange. Um, in fact, Euler sent this particular square to Lagrange with no explanation about how he had constructed it. You know? And then you know, Lagrange had to kind of work hard. And then you know, Euler eventually did publish the method. And then once Lagrange saw what Euler was doing, you know, he was really able to complete his proof. But it's, it's amazing to me that, that sort of this that might seem just like pure fun actually ends up having some, some really sort of deep and interesting consequences. If you find all the finite curves on there, uh, the rational and elliptic, yeah. Yeah, and they don't throw up what you need, can you prove that there are those? Can you prove that there are none of those other points floating out there? Is that provable? Can you say, yeah, there there aren't any points as well, or are they always going to be a bit of an unknown? I, with with current mathematical technology, I I would not know how to do that, and and I think that that's sort of just in general. It, it would be great to have some kind of mechanism to do exactly what you just asked. You know, can, you know, once I remove the rational elliptic curves, you know, can I find this sort of hypothetical set of finite points? Parker points. The Parker points, if you want, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, look, I know what you're thinking. What does Matt Parker himself think about all this? Well, wonder no more. We have a very special Matt Parker Reacts video on number file two. There's a link on the screen and in the video description.